right, so again, I'm going to go over chapter four today, and those of you who were in the previous class, I'm going to do it much the same way. I've uh, taken some of the programs that the author had and did some rewrite on them, and uh, we're going to go over those, plus we'll go over the stuff that's in the book little by little. All right, next week, just like in the C-sharp class, this will be lab in here next week. You'll have two programs that are due. We'll talk about those by the end of class. As we get started, just two things to mention to you real quick. First is, if you've never been out here, you can see it right there. It's literally, this looks kind of goofy, but uh, we'll do that next. Uh, it's called javaranch.com. Like I said, they've got this moose in there. That's their logo. But it's a nice little site. They've got a forum in there where you can post questions. And it's, you know, if you want to find out more about Java than you're getting in here, or you want to go work ahead or whatever, I mean, there are tons of sites all over the place, and you know that. But I, I've used this one in the past, especially for some of the um, forums, you know, when pe people post questions, there's some interesting stuff in there. All right, so that's the first thing. The second, again, this is what I wanted you to do, so hopefully this is what everyone has done. Don't worry about this last part in the blue. We're going to do that in a second. Again, uh, then I want you to go out to, in fact, you don't even have to do this. All right. I grabbed this from the last class. So don't worry about copying. All right. So you've already started up the virtual desktop, hopefully, if it's not already ran, been running, and you've started up Eclipse. What we're going to do is we are going to import three projects, projects in from the P drive. Not copy them. We're going to import them. We did this the other day, but there are at least three to four people who were not here the other day. So we're going to do it again. And those of you who've already done it, you can import more than one project at a time. So we're going to at least attempt to import all three of them in at the same time. So I'm taking for granted, because I asked you to do this from the get-go, that everybody is here right now. Again, yours might not look like mine. You can see I'm starting to write too many programs. But hopefully that's what yours looks like. So you're in, you're in Eclipse, all right, and you're at that window. Then what I want you to do is to click File and go down to Import, which is about two-thirds of the way down. Even if you did this the other day, because we're going to be importing different stuff than we did the other day. So a file import. What this is going to allow us to do is bring in everything all right, so you'll, you're going to have three more completely finished projects that are going to be over in your project area in just a couple minutes. All right, so on, after import, again, it, you, hopefully yours came up and looked something like this. We want the existing projects into workspace. All right, so if that's highlighted, click next, and then you've got to give it a path. Usually the easiest way to do this is to click the browse button. So I'm going to browse little different than the way we've been doing it. So you've got to browse and then go to computer. Under computer, you've got to go to the P drive. Under the P drive, you have to go down to CIS. Under CIS, you've got to go down to 152, 143, Java 1, and then to spring 2015, and then to in class, and then the, to the folder with today's date on it. All right, and if you say, well, you did that too fast, okay, Okay, so if you look, hopefully your screen looks at least something like this now. And if you say it doesn't, then yours might still look like this when you were back there. But if you click the next button, then hopefully it looks like this. What this says in English is what we are going to attempt to do right now is to go out to that root directory, which is the P drive with today's date on it. And if we didn't want to import, we want to import all three of these classes, you know, all three of these projects in. If we only wanted to import one of them, we would only check the one we wanted to import. All right, but since we want to import all three of them, make sure they're all checked. You can, you can select all, deselect all, or do it whatever way you want. But once you've got it looking like this, just click Finish. And then what should happen So if you decide
aside, let's let's suppose that that one uh, created a project and she wrote seasons, but she accidentally wrote S E E instead of S E A, and stuff like that happens. Then what she could do is she could just right mouse click on the name like this, go over to refactor, and then rename, and then she could rename her project. That's the way you're supposed to do it, not just manually click on it and change the name, which you'd be might be. Uh, you know, might have done already, like you know, back back and just from Windows or whatever. This not only renames this; it renames all the intermediate and files that you, files and the ones you don't see. All right. So we're going to start with the payroll program. So I'd like you to open that payroll program, and under Source, there's two files: there's Gross Pay and there's Payroll. Okay. And I'd like you to open up both of them: Gross Pay. And payroll. There's a payroll and a payroll two. I want you to open from the payroll folder, drill down, drill down into the payroll folder until you find gross pay and payroll. If you had any problems, raise your hand. I can come help you, or John will come help you. All right? And then please look up on the screen here. The first thing we want to do is that's not your package name. That's mine. So we're going to change that. So highlight edu.blackhawk.jscott, right mouse click on it, and again, go down to refactor, rename, and change that to whatever. You know, so Micah might put, you know, edu.blackhawk.students.msawyer or whatever. Whatever you have been putting in there for a package name. running a little smoother than it did the other day when I couldn't remember how to do this. The students had to help me. All right. Again, that's the way that you should internally rename things. You shouldn't just click on it and change the name because there are files that get written in the background. There are system files that this way it changes all those as well. Any questions on that? So that was that one. That, I did the payroll one first. You may have done the gross pay. It doesn't matter. But then go over to the other one and do the same thing. So again, highlight it. Not the colon, the semicolon, but edu.blackhawk.jscott. Right mouse click. Go to refactor, rename. And rename that one. So both of those files have been renamed. So does everybody understand what we've done? I created three projects and threw them out on the P drive. You imported them into your workspace, which means, in essence, you copied everything you needed to copy in there. That's a very fast way to go and copy a project from one place to another. All right. Then we went in and we refactored and did a rename. There's all sorts of ways that you can refactor. So what we're going to do here is we're first going to talk about this first payroll problem that's called payroll. Then we're going to talk about payroll two. Then we're going to talk about seasons. Then we're going to go and whip back, you know, back into the book. Everybody understand that? My guess is that we'll be done like we were in the last class. We'll be done no later than 11.30. And a couple of you have a meeting at 11.30, so that's one of the reasons I want to be done by then. All right? And your next homework assignment, we'll have time to discuss that also. Questions? All right, let's take a look at the payroll program. This is out of your book. Did everybody hear what I said? This one is out of your book. Okay? I didn't like the way the author did it, so I went and rewrote it, and that's payroll two. But this is right from out of your book. In fact, just so you know, this program here. is the payroll class that starts on page 205 and it goes up through about page 208. All right? So it's the payroll one and the gross pay. Everybody hear that? So, but I didn't want I didn't want to waste time typing it in. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with what the author did in this in this assignment or in this program, but I want to show you in just a minute how I changed it. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about gross pay right now, and I'm going to talk about the way he did payroll. Then we're going to bring up the second iteration of it, and I'm going to talk about what I changed. Does all that make sense? Then we'll talk about the seasons program, which is real simple little little thing. That, again, I ripped off from what he had in the book and just made a couple changes to it. All right. This is our class. The class is called gross pay. And the only reason I use this again is this is our author's code. All right. So let's take a look at what's in here. Okay. There's our package statement. Now we're importing java.util.scanner. I don't like that because that means we're going to be doing things from the command line. In other words, when we run this program, if you look up on the screen here, when I do a run run, oh, I, I guess I did change it. Good. All right. But the way that he's got it set up, it was going to have a scanner. I didn't like that. So I, did, I guess I did make a couple changes on that. But let's talk about what he's got, what he's doing in here. So let's talk about what's in here. So here's his class payroll, all right? He's doing a lot of things in here where he's introducing a lot of sloppy habits. I want you to understand this. The author is introducing in this section a lot of sloppy habits, and I'm going to show you some of them as we go through this. All right, so here's his comment. This class holds values for hours worked and hourly pay rate. It calculates gross pay and also figures out whether or not you've got overtime. Good. All right. So the class is payroll. We've got two variables that we're defining at the top of our program, hours worked and pay rate. They're both doubles. All right. There is no decimal type in Java like there is in C Sharp. So it's a double or a float, and almost always you just use doubles because they're easier to work with. Please look up on the screen here. Right now, this is our one and only constructor. So what this says is when we create a brand new payroll object, we can't pass it in anything. Everybody see that? Because there's, there's nothing in there. So when we come in here and we create a new payroll object, we've got to do it like this. That line right there, line 21 in the gross pay.java, will cause that to fire. So it'll set our hours work to zero, and it'll set our pay rate to zero. In the next one we look at, I overrode or I overloaded the constructor so you could do it another way. I'm not going to talk about that one yet. All right. So every time you, you create a brand new payroll object, you're going to set hours work to zero and pay rate to zero. Okay, so it's starting with a clean slate. All right. Now, when you call set hours worked, what's going to happen is we're going to be changing the hours. We're going to be passing in a variable called hours, and we're going to be this line right here. All right? If, if you're confused, please look up on the screen. This line right here, line 32, takes this value that we passed into this routine, which is there and there. It takes that value, and it copies it into that thing. All right? It's also, just so you know, because you're going to see this in later programs, I could have done this. I could have called them both hours worked. All right? And I could have done this. You're going to see this in later chapters. All right? But then if I do that, I've got to use the word this. So what I just changed this to would have been legal also. All right? We're not there yet, so I'm just going to get rid of that stuff. So this is our set routine, which says we're going to pass a value in, and we're going to use that value that we passed in to change hours worked. Okay? So it's like you were just hired. They don't have, an, they don't have how many hours you're going to work. They don't have your hourly rate. You're going to be a factory worker. So you walk in. All right? And they say, Ben, you're going to be working 40 hours a week. So hours is what be, they'd be passing in here, and you'd be setting hours worked to that. And then he says, fine, what are you going to pay me? So they tell him, 20 bucks an hour. So that's the rate that's going to be set to his pay rate, which is the value that's right here. 
So set routines are called mutators, again, because they are changing something. Okay? Then we've got get routines. So Ben gets home and his significant other or parent or whatever said, well, how many hours a week are you going to work? And he says 40. That's this. They said, how much are they paying you? And he says, 20 bucks an hour. That's this. Those are called accessors because we're not changing the value, we're accessing the value. Again, most of you are either have had already or are in the 147 class right now, the relational database development class. Gets are like select statements. You can't change data with a select statement. You typically don't change data with a get statement. All right, although you can. And we will in the get gross pay in just a minute. So here's our gross pay. This shouldn't look that, that different to most of you in here because, again, not all of you, but most of you are in both classes. And if you are in both classes, we already went through an example very similar to this one, all right, in the C Sharp class. We create two local variables, gross pay and overtime pay. Then we say if the hours you worked are greater than 40, what does that mean? That means you've got overtime coming. So your gross pay is 40 times your pay rate, and then you figure out your overtime pay, and your gross pay is equal to your gross pay plus your overtime pay. If you did not work greater than 40 hours, you get straight time. So it's just pay rate times hours worked. That should make sense really to everyone in here. All right? So I want to go over and look at, this is our, our, our demo program, so to speak, the one with the main in it. <clears throat> So, notice again, since, I want to go back to the beginning, here we go, that since we imported scanner, that says that we're, when we run this, we're going to be doing stuff from the command line, all right? And it's okay to do that, but I don't really like doing it, all right? So, notice when I do a run, run, how many hours a week did you work? All right, so I type in there 40. What's your pay rate? I type in 20, and it says you made $800. That makes sense? That's no overtime. I run it again, and it says, how many hours did you work? And this time I say, I want to put some overtime in there, so I say 50. What's your pay rate? 10. All right, so I've got 50 extra dollars in overtime pay. Okay? And that they're both correct. Notice that Unlike the stuff that we've been doing right now in the C-sharp class, how many hours did you work? Who knows? As soon as I type that in, it blows up. Because as of right now, we, d we don't have any exception handling in this program. There is none. So it blows up. That's okay. All right? We'll deal with that, but just not at the moment. So when we get down into here, here's our main. We're setting hours and rate. And then we're creating, it says here, a new keyboard, okay? And right here, that's instantiating or that's creating a brand new payroll object. Somebody tell me, what's the name of the payroll object? It's not a trick. Not all at once. What's the name of that payroll object? How's the, how about a hint? What's the name of that payroll object? Employee. All right? So... Now we're able to come in here, and I don't like this because he's filling this stuff up, but he's doing it from a command line, all right? And then when he gets done, he's using set hours and set pay rate. So this works, and there's really nothing wrong with it, but starting in Chapter 3 of our book, the last chapter that we went over, we weren't doing it like this. We were instead, all right, instead what we were doing is we were, in, we were creating objects in here not like this, where we used, created them and we used uh, a scan. We we're doing it the other way. So that's all I want to say about this particular example. So I'm going to close this. And I'm going to open up the one that's called Payroll 2. These are, this has got the changes that I made. And I'm going to again open up Payroll, and I'm going to open up Payroll Demo. And let me run this for you so you see it. All right? So run, run. Notice there's Employee 1. 
There's, there's employee two. I just gave them different names. So I'll explain those as we get on. Employee three, I went back and changed employee one. Employee four, employee five, employee six, and then I've got some final statistics. So this is more reminiscent of the way, as a programmer, you would actually write a Java program. So I took what the author put in there originally and made changes to it. All right. So what we're going to talk about now are the changes I made. And I'm going to start by going back to the payroll file. I added those constants, min hours, max hours, min pay, max pay, and max no OT. Are those pretty self-explanatory when you look at those and you look at the comments? Does, do those make sense? Those are constants. I'm saying you can't work less than an hour, more than 84, can't make less than 7 an hour, can't make more than 100. And if you work 40 hours or less, you're going to get straight time. That's what all those say. All right. Then I've got my program variables. My hours worked, my pay rate, my gross pay, and then I added a couple things. I want the total number of employees and the total gross. So every time I create a new employee, I'm going to add to a total employees counter. And every time I figure out that new employee's gross, I'm going to add that to a total gross counter. Does that make sense? All right. And then I also set in a decimal formatter. Okay, you're going to see all that stuff in just a minute. Now, in the NOR constructor, this is, if you look right here, that's the exact same stuff that the author had in the previous example, except he's not doing a total employee counter. Okay? So I added one to the total employee counter right there. Other than that, it's the same as what the author did in the previous example. But I want to be able to create a payroll object and pass something in. So this second constructor allows me to pass in a double representing the hours worked and a double representing the pay rate. Does that make sense? So when Ben comes in, he doesn't just, they don't just tell him he's got a job. They say, you got a job. You're working 40 hours a week. You're making 20 bucks an hour. All right? And then notice that rather than do the work in here, I call the set routines right from my constructor, which is totally permissible to do. Because if I don't do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab all the code that I've got in my set hours worked, and I'm going to copy it right there, which I could have done this also. Oops, not that. All right, so I could have grabbed all of this, copied it to the clipboard, removed that line, and pasted it. So I could have done that. But it would have been redundant code. And, again, you could make a case and say, well, it's a constructor. You should have redundant code. And some people believe that. But what I'm saying is, rather than putting the code in line, I've got two lines of code, which now, instead, it, it saved me from putting in that twice, and it saved me from having to put in that twice. Does that make sense to people? All right. So when, when in this one, when you call, you can either create a new payroll object and pass in nothing, or you can create a new payroll object and you can pass in two doubles. Since I have two methods that both have the same name, those are called overloaded methods. The system knows which one to pick based on what's in the parentheses or what's not in the parentheses. You can overload any method, including the constructor like we did here. You can overload any method as many times as you want, but whatever comes in between the parentheses must always be different in each one. And also, just so you know, as far as the compiler is concerned, you know, this HW and this PR, the compiler could care less. Those are names that we give for you. The compiler just cares double, double, and nothing. That's all the compiler cares about. All right? Okay, so I put a little bit of error checking in here. Not a lot, but a little bit. And it allowed me to, to, to put this in there also. And I want to grab this, copy it to the clipboard. And paste it in here just to show this to you. Oh, that's a little bit too big. All right. I'll line this up so it's a little easier to read. You may or may not have seen this before. I don't know.
That code that you see right there, and I guess I can make it a little bigger than that. That code that you see right there. Sometimes I should know when to leave well enough alone. But that code is the same as writing this. So this can be rewritten like this. And it works exactly the same way. Because what the system does is it says check hours. If it's greater than or equal to 1 and it's less than or equal to 84, that's valid. So that means take the variable and copy it over into hours worked. So the question mark means true action. If it's not true, do the false action, which comes after the colon, which means take max no, no OT, which is 40, and assign it to hours. So after I get done with that line of code or with this if statement, that means hours is e either going to equal a number between 1 and 84 that I passed in that was valid or the number 40 because of what I passed in was invalid. Okay? That's called the ternary operator. C Sharp has this. Java has this. JavaScript has this. PHP has this. Most programming languages have it. It's a shortcut operator. Do you ever have to use it? No. But in this case, it seemed like it made sense, and it allowed me you know, to, to show you that. And again, this is some error checking. So what I'm saying is, so notice now, when I, when I run this later, I'm going to put in a number that's less than min hours or a number that's greater than max hours to prove that it's going to change that to 40. Then I do the same thing with the pay rate. And I say, if your pay rate is between 7 and 100, then accept it. All right? And if it's not, take min pay, which is 7, and assign that to pay rate. So we're doing the same exact thing. So we're handling part of our error checking in here. We're handling range checking. We're not handling putting in non-numeric values. But there's some range checking that's being done in here. The get is the same for, for hours work. The get is the same for pay rate. The get is the same for get gross pay. I didn't change any of those, but I overrode the two-string method. This is what I print out at the end in those nice little boxes that has the information about the person. So notice what I'm doing. Hours worked, and I call the get hours worked routine. Hourly rate, and I call the get pay rate routine. Gross pay, and I call the get gross pay routine. All right? And then finally, what's new here, which was not in the other one, this allows me to get the total number of employees and the total gross. All right? And I didn't mention that before, but when we're figuring out the total gross, after we figure it out, we add that to total gross. <coughs> so this thing right there, that's an accumulator. We're accumulating the gross pay for all of our employees. So if we had 10 employees, and let's just say for a second, they all made $400. Then after one employee, we'd have total employees would be one, gross pay would be 400. After another one, total employees would be two, and gross pay would be 800, etc. When we got all done, total employees would be 10, and gross pay would be 4,000. All right? So if we look at the demo here, Again, I rewrote this, so I'll take full blame for it if there's anything screwed up in it. But I tried to set it up so it would be at least somewhat graphical. So instead of importing scanner, I imported option pay. All right, here's where I'm trying that, that constructor, that one right there, this, right there. That will call the constructor that's right here. So I'll, my total employees will now be one. 
and that person's hours worked will be zero, and their pay rate will be zero when I get done with that. That's what I've told it by this one. So this should be printing out employee one object after instantiation, and it should print all that stuff out, and you'll see it in a minute. Then I create another, a, a quote, normal payroll person who works 40 hours and makes $10 an hour. So my total employee should now be two, and my total gross should be 400, 40 times 10. All right? So again, when we come through here and we do this, Now we put in two. We've only done the gross pay for one employee, though. And that person worked 40 hours and made $10 an hour. So they should make $400. So right here, where we are, right here, after this one, that's what those totals should be. Then we do another employee. And that employee should be entitled to overtime because they work more than 40 hours. So our total employees is now three. So again, when we did the first one, it's one. We added another one to it to make it two. We just did another one, so it's now three. And the first time we went through this, 400 was our total gross pay. But now the second person worked 50 hours, so they get 40 times 20. Okay, in other words, that's their standard pay, so that's 800, and then 10 hours at time and a half. So they should have made $1,100. So when we get done with those two employees, now our count, or these three, our count is three, and our total gross pay is 1500 All right? Those... That was an employee that has no hours and no pay rate yet. That's a valid employee with no overtime. That's a valid employee with overtime. That's why I call them employee no OT and employee OT. All right. Then we put in some errors. We set some errors conditions up on purpose. Okay. Uh, or maybe not. Set hours work to 60. No, that's valid. And set pay rate to 25. So that's valid also. Okay, so after we do that, now we've added another employee. And that employee worked <coughs> 40 hours at $25 an hour, which is $1,000, and 20 hours at $37.50. Okay, so that's 1000 and I, I think it's $17.50. I may have done the math wrong, but you get the idea. Now we come in and we put in a bad. So we're creating a new payroll person, but we're giving them a bad number of hours. So since we've created another employee, we now have five. And we will change that employee's hours. All right, I think we changed it to, to 40. So it'll be 40 times 10, so that'll be 400. Right, so we've got done five employees, and we've set four total grosses. Then we go back, and we say, okay, that's a valid number of hours, but that's an invalid hourly rate. So that's going to be changed to seven. All right? So again, that will be 10 and seven when we get done. Okay? So when we go back and change that, we now have <clears throat> six employees. And 10 times 7, that one I should be able to handle, should be $70. Oops. All right. <clears throat> and then finally, <clears throat> we go back to employee 1. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. They're both bad here. All right. They're both bad. So it's 0, 0, so we should reset that one. And what did we say? We said that if you had a bad...
hours worked, we'll set it to 40, and a bad pay rate, we'll set it to minimum pay. So that should be 40 and 7. So that one, we should now have six employees, and that one should be $280. And I believe that when you add all these up, that the total comes out to $4,000. All right, when you add everything that's in there up, unless I did the math wrong, but that's what it should be. So we should have six employees, and I'm going to leave this up as we do it. It's going to flicker off the screen, but we'll bring it back just so you can see it. All right, so I run the program. There's my first employee. As we said, the first employee won't have any payroll, pay rate, so we haven't done that yet, but there's one employee now. Then we do our second employee. That's 40 times 10, so there's two employees, and that's their pay rate. Then we do employee 3, 50 and 20, so that's 1,100, so that's this one for employee 3. Then we'd go back to employee 1 again, and we reset their hours, and we reset their pay. So we still have three employees. But now, instead of that first employee had not having any kind of gross pay, their gross pay is $17.50. Then we go in and we do employee four. All right, this is the one for which we gave a bad, I think it was bad hours. So we set it to 40, and 40 times 10 was 400. Then we did another bad one, all right, where we had 10 hours, but we put in 10,000 for the hourly rate, which we set it to seven. 10 times seven was 70. Then we went back and redid the last one where they were both zero. So it reset our hours to 40 and it reset our pay to seven, which was 280. So we had six total employees and our total pay was 4,000. I can't think of any other way to explain it other than that that I think at least hopefully makes sense. Now, there will be some people who would look at what I did here and say, yeah, Jeff, everything you did was fine, not a bad program, but what you should have done is when you were creating these employee objects, instead of calling them stuff like employee no OT, employee OT, you should have called them like <coughs> Bill and Bob and Mary and Sue or employee one. or No, I call them what they are. That's an employee who doesn't work any overtime. That's an employee who works overtime. All right? That at least originally was an, an employee with a bad hours worked an employee with a bad hourly rate, an employee with both a bad hours worked and a bad hourly rate. So I tried to call them what they were. Hopefully that makes sense. Now that was a lot to throw at you, and we're going to take a break. But in what you've heard over the last 40 minutes or so, is there any, are there any questions? Because after the break, I'm done with this one now. After the break, the next program is a piece of cake. It really and truly is. Because it's this little thing in here with seasons. The whole program is right here. It's all inside of Maine. And when you run it, all it does is it asks you to put in a season. To type in spring or whatever. So if I type in spring, April showers, spring May flowers, and I put it in a loop. This is the first time we're running a program that we can run continuously. All right, so summer. All right. Yeah, I can either type in fall or I can type in autumn and winter, and when I want to quit the program, I type in quit. Okay? So we'll look at that one after the break. Let's take a break and come back, please, at 11 o'clock.